All right, welcome this morning. I, uh, I'm glad y'all all came to join us today. Got a uh, couple of announcements to make. Just want to let you know this past Friday, uh, we had our open house for our new Kenner Campus midweek facility. And uh, some of you came. Yeah, that's a cool thing. It's located at 3550 Williams Boulevard, which is uh, right next to the old Don Carter's bowling lane. It's an AMF now, but I can't quit calling it Don Carter's if you got that problem. You know what I'm talking about. And uh, we had a great time on Friday night, and our first event there is going to be tonight at 5 o'clock. We have our I Want to Know membership event, and if uh, you'd like to become a member of Celebration Church, that's the place where you go. We'll have dinner tonight, child care available. If you still need to sign up for that, you can use the back of your communication card to do so. I want to encourage you to do that. You'll just check off. I want to attend the I Want to Know, and I'll see you there tonight at 5 o'clock. That's located at 3550 Williams Boulevard. We're also going to be beginning youth ministry at that facility on Thursday nights, uh, which is going to begin on February the 12th, which is just a few weeks away, and then we'll begin adult midweek discipleship classes, collaborate is what we call that. That's going to be starting on Wednesday, February the 25th. So I want to invite all of you to come out, be a part of those things. It's going to be an awesome time together, and uh, we're going to be using that facility to do some great things. Our weekend services will continue meeting here at the Crown Plaza for the foreseeable future. I do want to remind you all, we have a 9 o'clock service that you can also join us for. is a little more room. If you like a little more room, uh, I want to encourage you to do that. And uh, we got children's ministry and uh, just the same service, so it'd be great to have you for that. So with that being said, as a couple of announcements, I uh, do want to take time uh, before we start to make a little confession. I don't know about y'all, but from time to time in my life, I get really distracted. Anybody know what I'm talking about if you get distracted easily? And uh, because of that, sometimes when I get up here to preach, I want to make sure I'm focused in on God. So before we read today's scripture, which is going to be from Philippians chapter 2, I just want to pray. Is that okay with y'all? All right, so why don't you just join in with me? If you're not easily distracted, just pray for me. And if you are, you're not paying attention right now anyway, but we can pray for yourself. And uh, so let's do that, and then we'll get started with today's message. Father, we just want to lift up our hearts and lives to you today. Lord, I know there's lots of distractions that want to get in the way with our relationship with you. It might be financial, it might be health-related, it might be work-related. There's all kinds of things that can take our minds, relationship problems, circumstances. But those are all tools and tactics of the enemy to keep us from being focused on you. So right now, in the name of Jesus, I just pray, Lord, that you would help me and everyone here to be focused on you. Let us laser in focus, zone in on you, really realize that you want to do something special in our lives today. Let us be receptive of it. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right. So if you got your Bibles, uh, I want to encourage you to turn to Philippians chapter 2. We're continuing on with our Live the Truth message series where we've been going through the book of Philippians. There's some sermon notes inside your worship guide. You can go ahead and take those out. I want to encourage you to do that. You can read along and follow along on those sermon notes, and our scripture verse will be right up here. This is what Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul writing to the church in Philippi, has to say. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Is there any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy. Let's say that phrase, truly happy, together on three. One, two, three. By agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and one purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble Thinking of others is better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had. Amen. You know, when I was growing up, my dad would always tell me that the thing that would make him truly happy was if I grew up to be a better man than he was. My dad said, if you grew up to be a better man than me, then I'll feel like I've done my job. I've been successful as a father. Matter of fact, that's my dad walking right there. Why don't y'all give him a round of applause? He, he just said, I have. So, I, you know, that makes, you know, that's right. I'm working hard, dad. He always told me that. He would make him truly happy if I would become a better man than him. Well, in the same way my dad would say that to me, the Apostle Paul was like a spiritual father to the church in Philippi. He was the one who founded the church. The Bible says he went to the city of Philippi, which was in the northern part of Greece, and he went down by a riverbank and just started preaching, 
and sharing the message of Jesus and encouraging people. And right there, their church formed and started, and there was a lady named Lydia who said, why don't you all come back to my house? And it was the first church in the city of Philippi. And the church faced all kinds of persecutions, but the Apostle Paul was always encouraging the church like a father to his children. And what he told them in this passage, he said, you know, it would make me truly happy if you would become like Christ Jesus in every area of your life, especially your attitude. You know, one of our primary purposes in life is to become like Christ. Romans 8.29 says this, From the very beginning, God decided that those who came to him, and he knew who would, should become like his son. In Ephesians 4, it says, We'll speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ. In verse 13, it says, Measuring up to the full stature of Christ. And here in Philippians 2.5, it says that we're to have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had. See, as Christians... We're supposed to use Jesus Christ as the model for our lives. It's him that we're supposed to be copying. He's our example, the one that we're supposed to follow. He's our pattern. He's what we're supposed to be emulating, duplicating, exemplifying, sampling. Jesus Christ is who we're representing. He's the perfect ideal, and we're to be constantly evaluating ourselves by the standard of Jesus Christ. See, what most people do in life is they find people that they know aren't as smart as them or aren't as financially successful as them or aren't as good-looking as them or aren't as nice as them or as moral as them or as godly as them. They surround themselves with those kind of people and they say, you know what, I'm doing pretty good. Matter of fact, if you ask most people, do you think you're going to go to heaven when you die? They say yes. If you said why, they would say because I'm a pretty good person. And what they mean is, I'm pretty good compared to all the people around me. But when we compare ourselves to Jesus Christ, it turns out we're not doing that good. See, that's supposed to be our standard. That's our model. That's the one we compare ourselves to. And if we want to become more like Jesus, in this passage of Scripture, it tells us we have to become more compassionate towards others. See, the word passion literally means a willingness to suffer. So compassion means that we're willing to suffer with somebody else. We're willing to go through a difficult life with them. We're willing to suffer with them because of how much we care about them. That's what it means to be compassionate. And Jesus literally embodied compassion because the Bible says he left the throne of heaven, took on the flesh of a man, took the form of a man, a human likeness, so that he could suffer alongside you and I. He could become human in a sense. He was still 100% God, but it allowed him to know what you suffer with, what you struggle with with, what you go through. He literally got on our level because he was so compassionate for us. In Philippians 2.1, we read this just a few seconds ago. It says, is there any comfort from his love, any fellowship together in the spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? And what we're talking about today is, what does it look like for you and I to live a compassionate life? If you're taking notes and writing down those sermon notes, this is the first fill in the blank you're going to write in. We can become, according to this passage of Scripture, more compassionate towards others when we focus on loving other people. In Philippians 2.2, it says, Make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other and loving one another. What's the opposite of agreeing with somebody? Disagreeing, right? You ever met somebody... They disagree with everything. It didn't matter what you're doing, they disagree with it. Where y'all want to go? Popeye's. Nah, I don't want that. Well, that's what everybody else wants. Well, I'm not going there. Y'all can go without me. Always being difficult, always being disagreeable. Are those people fun to be around? No, not at all. I mean, the truth is when you have disagreements, they create conflict. And the reality is that everybody sitting in this room has had conflict before in their life, right? Anybody ever had conflict with family? What about at work? Anybody ever had conflict at work? With your friends? Anybody, you married or you used to be married? (laughs) Had a lot of conflict in a marriage, you know what I'm talking about? You know, nothing can save you from conflict, even having a billion dollars. We've seen this in the newspaper all week long. Doesn't save you from conflict and disagreement. Some of you know what I'm talking about, right? See, here's the reality. Conflict and disagreement 
is a part of life. So what we have to learn how to do is how do we deal, how do we live and manage conflict? And from this passage, what we learn is the main thing that will help us overcome our disagreements with others is when we begin loving them sacrificially and unconditionally. See, Jesus said in John 13, verses 34 to 35, just as I have loved you, sacrificially he gave his life. Unconditionally, it doesn't matter what you've done in your past, Jesus loves you just the same. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other because your love for one another will prove to the world that you're my disciples. Now, here's the thing about love. People use that word all the time. People say, I love chocolate cake. I love apple pie. I love the saints. I love my wife. I love my kids. We just throw that word around. But what does it really mean? Well, here's the thing about love. Love isn't just a feeling. Love is an action. And if you're going to take the action of love, there's two parts of that you really have to focus on. The first part of that, we demonstrate genuine love for others by serving them. If you want to love somebody, you have to serve them. See, serving someone is an expression of love. It says in this passage, in in Galatians, a different passage in Scripture, Galatians 5.13, through love serve one another. I don't know whether you thought about this or not, But you don't wait till the feelings of love come before you start serving. You start serving someone, and then you start feeling like you love them. Matter of fact, when somebody's difficult to love, do you feel like serving them? No, you don't feel like serving them at all. But what this passage of Scripture is saying is that if you want to love somebody, it starts by serving them. See, God notices when we show our love by helping others. God notices when we serve somebody else. See, if your motive in serving someone is to get attention, then you're not really serving them. If your motive for loving somebody else is to everybody to see what you're doing. People do that all the time and say, hey, I just want you to know, I made my wife dinner, y'all. Y'all see this, right? I got my wife some coffee. Everybody noticed, right? Sometimes people will say it like, hey, baby, everybody just wants y'all to see I'm serving my wife. There's some people that even get mad when they serve somebody and it doesn't get recognized. Man, I served them and they didn't even say nothing. They didn't even say thank you. Well, then you're not serving. That's self-interest. You're worried about attention and people seeing you and people noticing you. Real serving doesn't do it so that other people will notice it. Real serving is about love. I love you, so I'll serve you. As a matter of fact, I can always tell you when a marriage relationship is heading for doom and separation and divorce because the people in the marriage don't serve one another. They make their own plates of food. They make their own drinks. They get their own stuff. I worry about me. You worry about you. They make just half the bed. You can always tell when a marriage is headed for disaster because people stop serving one another. There's got to be serving someone if there's going to be love, and that's how we love somebody else. There's somebody in your life right now that you don't feel like loving, and the way that you need to start loving them is by serving them, even though you don't feel like it. The other way that we demonstrate this genuine kind of love is not just by the action of serving someone, but it's also by reconciling with them. In Philippians 2, 2, it said, May it will make me truly happy that if y'all are agreeing wholeheartedly with each other. Now, as we've stated, conflict is inevitable for everyone, but we should pursue reconciliation through loving one another and following the biblical model for making things right. In Matthew 18, it talks about this. It says, If a brother or a sister in Christ offends you, the way that you need to deal with it is by going directly to them. You don't need to talk to three or four other people. You don't need to get a bunch of people involved. You don't need to call the pastor. You just need to go straight to them and say, hey, me and you need to deal with this conflict and disagreement we have. We need to reconcile. Romans 12, 18, it says, do your part to live in peace with everyone as much as possible. Now, let me ask you this. If you're going to try to reconcile with somebody and you go to them and you say, listen, there's some things you need to apologize to me for. How do you think that's going to go over? You think that's going to lead to reconciliation or more conflict? More conflict, right? See, if you want to reconcile with somebody, you know what it starts with? You asking for forgiveness. Even if you think you're right. I'm about to save a whole lot of husbands a whole lot of grief. Apologize even when you're right. Hey, I just want you to know I'm sorry for how I treated you, for what my actions were, 
for the way I handled this situation, for the way I lost my cool, for the way that I spoke to you. See, when you seek forgiveness first, that paves the way for reconciliation. That has to be your attitude and your mindset. And here's the reality. Just because you seek forgiveness from somebody, does that mean they're going to give it to you? Nope. And does that mean they're going to ask for forgiveness back from you? No. But let me tell you, when you seek forgiveness, it's going to free you. It's going to liberate you. It's going to take the burden and the bondage off of you. And if they don't choose to forgive you, guess who's going to leave miserable? They are, not you. See, the Bible says that we're to live what's called above reproach. Now, that's not a word we use a whole lot. R-E-P-R-O-A-C-H. It's not above reproach. I heard somebody say that one time. That's not what it is. It's above reproach. And do you know what that means, to live above reproach? It means that nobody can point a finger at you and say, you wronged me and you never tried to make it right. See, as a Christian, when it comes to loving other people, you have to be the initiator of seeking forgiveness, the initiator of reconciliation. Matter of fact, there's people in your life right now that you need to seek reconciliation with, and you don't want to. But God's convicting you. God's working in your life, and you're realizing, you know what? I need to seek forgiveness from that person. I need to be reconciled to them. In Ephesians 4, it talks about this. It says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of malicious behavior. Be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as Jesus Christ has forgiven you. A lot of people are thinking, well, what if I ask them for forgiveness and I was right, then they're going to get off the hook. You know what? Maybe they will. But maybe you'll get off the hook too, the hook of bitterness and anger and resentment, and you need to let that thing go. If you want to love people, you got to serve them. If you want to love people, you got to be reconciled to them. We become more compassionate when we focus on loving others. We also become more compassionate when we focus on cooperating with other Christians. In Philippians 2.2, 2, it says, it, it would make me truly happy if y'all are working together with one mind and one purpose. Do you know, 58 times in the New Testament, it says that Christians are to help one another. In 1 Corinthians 3.9, it says that we're partners working together for God. I don't know whether you realize this or not, but it turns out God knows what he's doing. And God knows that when we cooperate with one another, it allows us to accomplish more. See, that's what helps a person or a group to be successful when everyone gets on the same page. Everybody's working together. Everybody's cooperating. See, we all, everybody in this room, we have some things we share in common. We're all sinful and jacked up. And Jesus still loved us all and still died for us all. And if we'll surrender our lives to him and live for him, we'll have eternal life in heaven and an abundant life on earth. And that agreement that we can come together, that that's why it's all about Jesus. It's all about worshiping him and who he is and what he's done for us and how much he loves us. It's not about whether we agree on the music. Honestly, I don't care whether or not you like the music or you think it's too loud or too low. I don't care whether you like my preaching or you think that I speak ignorantly from time to time, because I do. I don't care whether you like the coffee. If you think it's too strong or too weak, it was free. Get over it. I don't care if you think the chairs are comfortable or uncomfortable. Honestly, it doesn't matter. What we can agree on is we all have one thing in common. It's that we need Jesus to liberate us and to set us free from our sin. See, I'm going to be honest, the church in America is disorganized, self-conflicted, full of gossip and judgment, denominationalism, and just plain laziness. In the church today, people are very quick to pass the buck, point the finger elsewhere, quick to cast stones, to pass quick judgments. You know, probably the biggest sin in the church is making excuses. It's easy to make an excuse. Let me do a survey. How many of y'all are tired? Like, you just tired. Just be honest. You're just tired of life. Just put your hand up. Look around the room. Put it high. Be, a, be, a, be proud. I'm tired. I got four kids. I'm always tired. I'm going to be honest with y'all. And my wife's more tired than me if we comparing, right? The truth is we can make all kinds of excuses. We can be tired. We can be busy. We can have too much going on. We can have conflicting priorities. But the reality is at some point we got to stop making excuses and realize we have a responsibility as a body of Christ in the church of God. You know what the worst excuse is? I'm not hurting anybody but myself. 
I'm not hurting anybody but myself. Can I just tell you, that is the most anti-biblical statement I can think of. The Bible says this is the body of Christ, and every single person has a contribution to make, and if you don't make your contribution, the whole body suffers. In Acts 2.44, it says this, the believers, the Christians, the first Christians, shared everything they had with each other. Well, what does that mean, they shared? What are they sharing? What did we need to share with each other? Well, I'm going to give you three things. First, we need to share our abilities with others. In Romans 12, 6, it says that God has given each of us the ability to do certain things well. Every person in this room, you got the ability to do something well that God gave you, he created you with and gifted you with it. And that ability is an indication that God has an intention for you. There's something he wants to do with that ability. Now, a lot of people feel like the only time God is pleased with them is when they're doing something spiritual. Like God's only happy with you when you're reading the Bible or you're praying, or you're worshiping, or you're attending church, or you're fasting. Can I just tell you nothing's further from the truth? God is pleased with every single thing you do in your life. I mean, the Bible says that God is our Father, and we as His children. My little nine-month-old son, Sammy, everything he do, I'm proud of. Everything he does, I'm proud of. That was my bad English. You saw that. (laughs) Confessing. Everything he does, I'm proud of. Everything he does lights me up. I mean, I could watch him sleeping. I'm like, man, that looks so awesome. Look at that baby sleeping. I could watch him eating, and I'm proud of it. Man, look how incredible and amazing that is. I'm so pleased at how well he's eating. He might be burping. He might let out a big old man belch. Man, that's right. That's my son. He's a man right there. I'm proud of that. I mean, you think about it, right? I mean, is this impressive to you? Watch this. Are you impressed? You know what I did? I just took two steps. Wasn't that incredible? Y'all give me a round of applause. Amen. Now, here's the thing. If my nine-month-old son took those two steps, you think it would light me up? Oh, yeah, it'd light me up. Why? Because that's my son. And everything he does pleases me and makes me proud, and brings joy and happiness to my life. And God looks at you the same way. Every single ability you have, when God looks at you using it, it makes him proud and full of joy and brings pleasing feelings to him. See, you can wash dishes, repair a machine, sell a product, write a computer program, grow a crop. You can raise a family for the glory of God. Like a proud parent, God enjoys watching everything you do except for sin. Everything else that you do can bring glory and honor to God. See, God intentionally given us different for his enjoyment. He made some of you to be athletic and some to be analytic. Some of you are gifted at mechanics or mathematics or music or a thousand other skills. Any of these things can bring a smile to God's face and joy to him and be pleasing to him. You know, we were getting ready all week for uh, the opening of our, our new midweek facility that we had the open house for on Friday. And uh, one of the guys that volunteers here regularly, his name's Sonny Mitchell. And Sonny came out, Sonny put in about 25 hours this week, maybe even more than that, just volunteering his time. And when he got over there, he said, man, I want to build this desk. It's going to be awesome. Will you let me build the desk? I said, build the desk, brother, build the desk. (laughs) So he volunteered his time. He built this incredible desk from scratch and set it up. And here's the thing. I kept telling him, man, thank you so much for serving. Thank you for giving your time. Thank you for volunteering. And he kept saying, man, I love doing this. This is my church. This is what I want to do. He's got all kind of ideas. Can I do it? I mean, man, yeah, use your abilities for the Lord, man. See, he was pleased and God was pleased. Because God got great joy that Sonny was using the abilities he had in order to serve God's kingdom and to build God's kingdom. And just like Sonny, every one of you sitting in this room have abilities that you can use for the kingdom of God, but you got to make yourself available to God for him to use them. There's a great movie called Chariots of Fire, and in it there's an Olympic runner named Eric Liddell who was a great Christian who made this statement in the movie. He said, I believe God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel God's pleasure. To give up running would be to hold him in contempt. See, if you don't use the abilities that God's given you to serve him, then what you're doing is you're holding God in contempt for giving you those abilities and then you're just wasting them. Can I just tell you, there are no unspiritual abilities, only misused ones. I want you to notice, as your pastor, there's nothing that brings joy to me 
like helping somebody else learn how to use their abilities to build the kingdom of God. If you have an ability and you know what it is, but you don't know how to use it for the sake of God's kingdom, just call me, email me, write it on your communication card. I would love to help you find out how to use that ability. I'm a creative person. That's one of the abilities God gave me. And I will find a creative way for you to use that ability to serve God and his kingdom. Matter of fact, when I was a new Christian, this is what brought most joy to me. When I grew up, I was raised Catholic. And I would not call a priest a preacher, if you know what I'm saying. And I grew up like that, and I remember being a young teenager and saying to myself, man, if there was a job where you could speak in front of people and change their lives, I want to do that job. But I didn't know that job existed because the priest wasn't doing that to me. And besides, priests can't get married, and I wasn't about to give that up, if you know what I'm saying. (laughs) I'm human, you know what I mean? Amen. (laughs) See, here's the thing. I went on a mission trip to Kerrville, Texas when I was 20 years old. And I don't even know where Kerrville, Texas is, I'm going to be honest. I'm just kidding. It's Iowa North of San Antonio. I went to Kerrville, Texas, and on that trip, I realized that I had abilities in me, and God wanted to use them for his glory, and it brought so much joy to me that God was using me in the abilities that I had. And that set me up. I didn't have a plan to be a preacher. I wasn't groomed for this. I got baby pictures with a beer and a cigarette in my mouth. Baby pictures. More than one. This was not the path for my life, but when I found out that I had abilities that God wanted to use, that's what really brought significant joy and freedom and liberty and purpose to my life. And where you sit in that, you got abilities, and if you don't know how to put them to work in the kingdom of God, you let me know. We'll figure out a way to help you use them. you got to share your abilities with each other. you got to share your experiences with each other. In Proverbs 27, it says, people learn from one another just as iron sharpens iron. I don't know if you figured this out or not, but in life, you don't have enough time to learn everything the hard way by experience and mistakes. There are some things you need to learn from somebody else's experience, and that's why God needs you sharing your experiences with others. And then you've got to share your problems with others. In Galatians 6, 2, it says, share each other's troubles and problems. Why do we do all this? Because 1 John 3, 16 tells us we know what real love is because Christ gave up his life for us. And so we also ought to give up our lives for our Christian brothers and sisters. When you start serving, when you start using your abilities to build the kingdom and you bless and make a difference in the life of somebody else, it will bring so much joy and peace and purpose and fulfillment to you. But you got to make those things available for God to use. It's about cooperating with somebody else. That breeds compassion within you. We become more compassionate when we focus on loving others and cooperating with other Christians. We also become more compassionate towards others as we focus on conquering our self-centeredness. Most of us in this room struggle with self-centeredness at times. But being self-focused is the exact opposite of being Christ-like. Jesus talked about that in Matthew 20, 28. He said, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. See, Jesus didn't come to be served. Jesus came to be a servant. He was not selfish and self-focused and self-centered. See, in order for us to become more compassionate, we have to get over ourselves. And if we're going to do that, there's two areas we really need to focus on conquering. One is arrogance. Every one of us needs to focus on conquering arrogance. In Philippians 2.3, it says this, Don't try to impress others. Be humble thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't try to impress others, but be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Do you ever see a person that's real successful in business, but a terrible husband or father? You ever see somebody that they can do everything well in their workplace, but then they get home and they can't do nothing right? Why is that? You ever thought about that? I'm going to tell you why. Success breeds arrogance. Successful people become arrogant. Successful people think you should worship the ground that you walk, they walk on. They think you should just serve them and meet their demands and needs. Successful people think that everyone should just bow down to their whims and what they want to happen. Success breeds arrogance. And you know what arrogance breeds? Ignorance. Arrogance breeds ignorance. And you know what ignorance breeds? Foolishness. And you know what foolishness breeds? Failure. And that's why. A person can be successful in a workplace and come home and think they should be treated great just because they were successful at work. 
You can't be treated great at home until you're successful at home too. But to be successful at home, you have to be humble. You got to be able to make a business deal and come home and wash the dishes. You got to be humble. Pride is a subtle stronghold that keeps us from caring for others and from closeness with the Lord. You know, my first job at Celebration Church was not preaching sermons. My first job was vacuuming carpets and taking out trash and putting water in plant pots. And my boss was this guy named uh, Hank Terry. No, I I didn't even get Chris as my boss, for those of you who know him. I I was like under him, you know. And Hank Terry was my boss, and Hank wasn't a real super smart guy. Hank didn't have a lot together. He didn't have a sense of fashion. He was just kind of, you know, humble guy. Serving the Lord. Hank wasn't trying to be the pastor. He wasn't trying to be the boss. He wasn't trying to be the manager, the supervisor. He was just trying to glorify God. And he would drive in the parking lot of church at 6 o'clock every morning. He would yell out, praise Jesus, like a crazy person. Because he was just so grateful that Jesus would use him to do anything. But I tell you, you know what Hank had? You're not gonna, he's not on Instagram and Twitter. He don't even on Facebook. He passed away about three years ago of cancer. But you know what he always had? A great relationship with God. He had humility. And you know why God blessed him so much? Because the Bible tells us. 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6. Dress yourselves in humility as you relate to one another. For God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. If you ever met a person that was arrogant and said they were blessed, they were lying. Because God doesn't bless prideful, arrogant people. God only blesses humble people. Grace means undeserved blessing. It says that when you are humble, God gives you undeserved blessing. But when you're prideful, God's playing defense and he's real stingy. God opposes the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. Every single one of us has to evaluate our lives and ask ourselves, am I really humble? Or have I allowed arrogance and ignorance and foolishness to creep in? The other thing we have to conquer is selfishness. Just pure, unadulterated, unfiltered, concentrated selfishness. Philippians 2, 3 and 4 says, don't be selfish. Don't look out for your own interests but take an interest in others too. Don't be selfish. Matter of fact, tell your neighbor, don't be selfish. Now tell your second choice, don't be selfish. Now tell yourself, look at yourself, do like this, put a little bit, don't be selfish. Don't be selfish. Don't be selfish. Don't look out for your own interest, but take an interest in others too. That might be one of the most powerful Bible verses they got, don't be selfish. See, many people are taught to focus on furthering their ambitions rather than serving the Lord and others. The way this manifests itself is a lot of atheistic and evolution theology and philosophy is that if you want to be successful in life, you got to be selfish. Look out for you. Look out for you. Take care of yourself. Only worry about you. If you got to step on somebody's toes or even their head to be successful, you go for what you know. Worry about you. Get yours and don't worry about anybody else. Can I just tell you? Jesus said exactly the opposite. In Luke 9, 23, Jesus said, If any of you wants to be my follower, you must put aside your selfish ambition, shoulder your cross daily, and follow me. The biggest obstacle to being a follower of Jesus, the biggest obstacle to being Christ-like is not sin. It's selfishness. And when you learn to conquer yourself, that's when you really start to have freedom. The last verse in this Philippians passage sums up everything. It says that you need to have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. You should have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Did Jesus love you? Did he serve you? Did he reconcile you? You bet he did. Did Jesus do it all by himself or did he cooperate with others? Yeah, he had a team, didn't he? The disciples, that's who they were. They were his closest followers. They shared that last supper together we talked about earlier. And he challenged them to share their abilities with one another, to share their experiences, to even share their trouble and their suffering and pain with one another. That was Jesus' attitude. And then Jesus' attitude was certainly one of unselfishness. He wasn't arrogant, he was humble. He was a servant. Jesus could have been arrogant, couldn't he? 
I mean, let me ask you this. If I gave you all the power in the world to perform miracles, would you become arrogant? Of course you would, because you're fleshly and selfish. But Jesus wasn't. He was humble. And what you need to do is learn to humble yourself and make yourself available to God. you got to have the same attitude as Jesus Christ. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a second. I'm going to ask our prayer leaders who are available to come and make their way to the front. Don't let them distract you as they're going by you. I just want you to focus in on God for a second. Greg's going to start playing some music, so you'll hear that too. But don't worry about that. Just focus on Jesus for a minute. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others is better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Is that you? Do you have compassion in your heart for others? Do you love them? Are there people in your life you need to start serving because you don't feel like serving them? Are there people you need to be reconciled to but you don't feel like reconciling with them? Do you need to start using your abilities and your experiences and your pain to serve the kingdom of God, to share with others, to have compassion? Do you need to get over selfishness? arrogance, pride. If the Lord's convicting you of any of those things today, if he's working on your heart, if he's saying, hey, I want you to do something about this in your life, in just a moment, I want you to come and respond by walking up here, taking the hands of one of these folks up here and letting us pray for you, that God would free you and liberate you and empower you to live a compassionate, Jesus-centered, Christ-like life. Don't be too prideful to think, well, I don't want to go up there for prayer. People are going to see me. That's that pride kicking in again. Be humble. It's time for you to let Jesus work in this area of your life so that you can make him truly happy and you can be truly happy using the things God has in your life to make a difference in this world. You might need to come forward for prayer for a health issue or a financial issue or a family issue or a relationship issue. You have the availability to do that as well. But if you need to do business with God today, I want you to do just that. So with that being said, I invite you to all stand together. And as you're standing, if you need to respond to today's message, some people are already coming. I want to invite you to come down, take the hands of one of these folks up here. Let us pray for you and minister to you that God would free you and liberate you and encourage you and build you up and use you and your abilities and your talents and your humility to make a difference in the kingdom of God. As people are responding, we're going to sing out with Greg to worship the Lord. I want you to join in with us. We're going to take time to pray for you as long as we need. Let's lift up the name of the Lord.